Hello everyone. Yes, I am back. I apologize. There hasn't been a lot of videos lately. Um, I mean, I guess it's been like that for a while on this channel. Bear with me. I'm hoping to come back with more content. Won't be as regular as it once was, but like I do have a lot of reviews I still want to do of some older records and there's still new stuff coming out that I sometimes do want to talk about. Like the case of this record, which is also a film that came out three weeks ago now. This month of September is just completely flying by. It's mind boggling. Um, and this is by an artist who I'm sure a lot of people have been wanting to have me review on this channel for quite some time as she has released an album already four years ago. This is Melanie Martinez. Uh, she is an American electro pop artist that I have been criminally sleeping on for far too long. And so I can safely say that my Melanie Martinez cherry has finally been popped. I had heard a few songs off of her first album, Cry Baby, from 2015. I'd heard Carousel, and I saw the music video for it. I thought it was really cool. Um, and I might have heard a little bit of Pacify Her. I'm not entirely sure. For whatever reason, I just, four years ago, I mean, I don't know, things, I just, I didn't feel the urge, and I didn't have this channel back then, so I didn't think I needed to explore other artists as much. Um, and so over time, I've become more, you know, open to exploring artists. But if an artist doesn't immediately look interesting, I just sort of like, if it doesn't come up in my space, I just end up not following them. And for whatever reason, I'd seen a lot of hype about Melanie, but I already had so many artists that I were, was fixated on that I just didn't have the space or the time to just devote to what I really wanted to get, you know, to get into her music and everything. I, I kind of figured I would eventually. And that's how it is with a lot of these artists. Um, and what better way to do so than when they come back and release a new project. So this is her second studio record called K through 12, which is also a film. Apparently her first album was also a visual album and that every song had a music video. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think so. But it wasn't like strung together like a full length feature film, which K through 12 now is. It was released on September 6th. It took her probably around like three years to make, considering, I mean, she didn't probably start making it right after the Cry, Bear, Cry Baby came out. I think it's interesting that she's releasing this album the exact same time of year that Cry Baby came out four years ago. Um, and if you know me, the four-year cycle is an important cycle in my mind. I'm still very much uh, kind of stuck on that like college, high school, four-year cycle in my head. Like, Every four years, you're a new freshman again, and then you're a senior, and you keep cycling back through that. And I see a lot of patterns beyond just like presidential elections and the Olympics happening on those four-year patterns or two-year patterns. So uh, I just find it really cool and coincidental that Melanie seems to be also following that pattern. And I, you know, some people might be like, oh, so now we have to wait all the way until 2023 to get the next part of K through 12. Um, maybe, but I mean, if it's the amount of detail and you know effort that was put into k through 12 then like honestly we shouldn't complain it's it's understandable why it took so long this was completely written and directed presumably by melanie herself of course she did have people helping her out and everything but like the music the visuals the art direction it was all melanie and so much money was seeped into this film. Uh, apparently it cost like $4 million or something to make this film. So, I mean, the capital, the resources, the setting, I mean, I only wonder where they filmed this. I think they filmed it in the UK. Um, it's just absolutely amazing. And it's really nice that she did have it show in actual theaters to promote this record because it is kind of like a movie musical. A very twisted one at that. A very Tim Burton one. So, uh, let's see. Cry Baby is apparently the name of, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I have not done the research. This is probably backwards from how, this is definitely backwards from how I should be covering Melanie on this channel. Um, I had thought that I would hold off and cover Cry Baby first, because now that I'm covering K-12, through I really do feel like I should invest myself and really discover Cry Baby and listen to those songs and then film a review for it and hopefully sooner rather than later. So I really don't want it to be too long before I get back into that, uh, maybe like a month or something. Uh, but I do want to film a Cry Baby review. But I've kind of done a little bit of the backstory research, though I was very confused on certain aspects. Melanie's character is called Cry Baby. And so this is a character that has, you know, the same parents from the first set of films 
who's now going to school. And so from my understanding, it's sort of like Crybaby was like a toddler in the first set of music videos. That's why, you know, there was like pacifier imagery and she was like, and you know, it was like, this is the baby. Um, and now she's finally graduated to go to kindergarten. And now this film covers kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, which in the American school system is, you know, the, the, you know, primary and secondary education that you are required to go to if you, before you go to college, uh, usually between the ages of six and 18 or seven and 18. So um, in this film, we see Melanie's character, Crybaby, as I said, start going to school. And of course, if con continuing the theme of childlike metaphors representing something much more adult uh, in her songwriting, we see song titles like Wheels on the Bus, Lunchbox Friends, Nurse's Office, High School Sweethearts. Um, and it does sort of appear chronological to some extent in that, you know, the high school stuff is later on in the record, like the song High School Sweethearts, which is one of my favorite songs on this album, by the way. Um, as we progress, the, the lunch period's kind of in the middle, because, you know, lunch is usually about in the middle of the day. We start out with, obviously, Wheels on the Bus, which is, of course, sampling that iconic children's song. Uh, and then we enter into the school day. We start out with show and tell. We start out with you know, class fights and uh, getting to know everyone. And then we end with the school dance. We end with prom and then a whole lot of stuff goes down and there's all this drama and there's like love and miscommunication. And it's a really interesting story. And I definitely would like to watch this film a second time because I was definitely very confused. And I will say that for the first half of the film, while I was watching it, there was a small part of me that just didn't feel like I was quite there. Um, something that really blew me away about the film was obviously the set design. I mean, I was in, I was in awe at the fact that Melanie is definitely more of like an alternative artist and not probably getting like, I don't know. I mean, she's probably doing really well with streams and sales, but it shocks me that Melanie can afford to make a music video, this, a movie music video that is so lavish and so the CGI and like the set design and the, I was just blown away by the amount of money and resources that this would take that usually only artists like Beyonce or Katy Perry can pull off these days. Um, I'm just completely in awe. Um, Melanie must have put so much of money behind this. I was kind of like, and Tim Burton, you know, I love him. He's, I love the creative vision. I love the twisted fairy tale aesthetic, but sometimes it's a little over the top for me. Things are a little too on the nose. There were some moments at the beginning of this film where I thought it was a little cheesy, you know, um, having like the, having some of the aesthetics the way they were. Um, but then it, after you get used to that, after you get used to the costuming and sort of the over-the-top dramatization of all these characters, you completely overcome any of that, any of those queries and you get so soaked up. So by the second half, I was just like, oh my God, I'm so into this and I'm so invested into the characters. And I also, this was, by the way, the first time I was hearing the songs. So I didn't listen to the album before I watched the film. And so, of course, I have since then listened to several of the songs on their own. And I will say that this album, there are definitely songs that stand out. And then there are definitely a lot of songs that I do feel like are great in the cinematic aspect of the movie, but then on their own sort of all sound a little similar to me. Like there isn't a whole lot of variety in terms of some of the production styles and the sonics. But I mean, you know, it's still all about the lyrics at, to a huge extent. I really do feel like Melanie's music is so rich with metaphor and so rich in the storytelling that like you really shouldn't get too caught up on the sonics of it. Um, there are some great hooks like Wheels on the Bus has this gorgeous sort of lofty kind of calming hook that uh, separates uh, out the rest of the song, which I think is a little very sort of rap hip hop, punctuated, urban feeling. It's very edgy. And that part doesn't draw me into the song as much because it's just some, it's a little unsyncopated. Um, you know, she sings about Tommy's got his ass on the glass. And then we actually see Tommy with his ass on the glass. And I'm going to take a, you know, pass and puff it, which I think is a weird reference for a song that's supposedly about little kids. But at the same time, the metaphors are all there. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be about weed. It could be about whatever kids are peered into, pressured into 
being a part of at the young age when they first go to school and go to kindergarten or go to first grade on the bus for the first time. Um, the school bus driver definitely reminded me a lot of my middle school bus driver. He just looked eerily similar. So that was like an interesting thing. And I remember that, you know, middle school school bus rides on the way home were an absolute nightmare. Um, so the things that they had to put up with, yeah. Uh, so it definitely takes me back. Um, it's interesting to me. I mean, Melanie is obviously, you know, trying to tell this story of this character's life that is very much emblematic of her own experience, but also a universal experience that I think so many people go through, going through school, going through being a child. You know, she touches on, you know, family members that aren't there because of alcoholism. You know, she tries calling her mom and it's like, oh, I know she's not going to be on the other end. And she isn't. It's sort of like, like she amalgamates all of these different social kind of issues, like uh, tampons in schools, for example, the com the sisterhood that ends up being formed because of that shared struggle of getting your first period, which usually happens around 13, 14, uh, around middle school. Um, so of course, that's placed in the middle of this film. Everything is like these different milestones. The first time you go to detention, the first time you go to the nurse's office. Um, the first school fight you see in a cafeteria, all of these things um, it touches on all of these issues that arise as you get to the different stages of your schooling career. But at the same time, it's also referencing and using the entire school experience as a metaphor for what happens after 12th grade. You know, I think the most obvious example would be the song Show and Tell. Obviously on the surface, you know, she's using the metaphor of show and tell, which is something you do in like early elementary school kindergarten to allude to the performance of being a pop star in the modern era. But also, I mean, every era, being a pop star is always exploitative in a certain way, especially when you consider paparazzi, when you consider tabloids, people paying to get nude photos of you, the way that record labels treat you like this hot commodity, particularly young women in this industry, and that they want to sell you because of how you look. It's really messed up, but it's definitely 100% what happens. And so Melanie in that song, Show and Tell, which is one of my favorite songs and segments of the whole film, I feel like I could spend just a whole lot of time speaking specifically about that segment and song in this film. Um, because I just love the uh, marionette doll uh, routine that she does, which in front of the very eager, like, first grade students who play their characters so creepily well. I think the acting is really strong in this film for almost all the characters involved. Um, you know, uh, show me more, give me more. You can see how she's talking to her fans in a little bit of a way. It's sort of like the pop star is just this, empty performing shell. I don't know if any of you have seen the Miley Cyrus Black Mirror episode, um, but I just watched it. I know I'm a little late. I've actually only just gotten into Black Mirror, which I know I've been sleeping on a lot of stuff, but forgive me. Um, there's an episode of Black Mirror where there's this pop star named Ashley O, and uh, she's basically drained and milked for everything she's worth by her manipulative aunt and her sort of capitalist money-hungry executives who don't care at all about what Miley's character actually thinks or feels. And so the whole plot sort of talks about how that sort of uh, devolves and turns into this really kind of ugly real situation, but that's also very sci-fi and there's all this cool stuff that happens with AI and it's a really interesting episode. I highly recommend you check it out. Well, Show and Tell is an exact conversation. It's in perfect conversation with that storyline. Um, the way she's presenting herself as a puppet with strings, you know, performing for a very eager audience who will pay her, but do they really care about what's beyond the facade? Do they really let this artist take breaks? You know, artists are considered con constantly expected to be go, 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 constantly make money, constantly perform, um, give the fans, feed them music. And so uh, the line that really sticks out is art doesn't sell unless you F every authority. I was like, dang, that's like, that's like the thesis statement of thesis statements here. Um, and it's true. And it's definitely been true in the past. It's definitely changing slowly as we get more women and like better, less capitalist kind of mindsets in music. But I mean, the music industry 
it's a really messed up place. Like, I don't see it getting any better anytime soon. I'm sorry. Like, just seeing what's been going on with Taylor Swift and with Nicki Minaj and with Cupcake and with Curly and with Kesha and with almost every single big pop st female pop artist, you see just how much, you know, misogyny and how much behind closed doors, like, there's just so much entrapment and there's just very, you know, very draconian practices going on. Um, feuds that are artificially created to prop up one artist at the expense of another, um, all for money. It's all about the dollar bill. Um, and it's a madhouse. I, I, and it, it's, re it's really gotten to an extreme. And I don't know, you know, at one point that whole system is finally going to collapse, but it's going to shake up everything. And I do think it's slowly starting to shake up more as, uh, you know, um, crowdsourcing and like artists being a little bit more independent or forming their own record labels or being able to break the molds and do what they want. That's slowly becoming a thing. But it's still like this system that we're within the music industry. So yeah, it's it's a mess. So show and tell. Oh yeah, I can see where that's going. And I have to say that I really do just I, the song feels like a marionette performance. Like even if I hadn't seen the music video and I just heard that song, I would still hear it in my head and uh, and see the image of her as this marionette doll making all these sort of like plastic doll you know, moves because the song feels synthetic in that way and how it's produced and the choppiness of it. All of these songs have like a childlike innocence to the instrumentals, but then like this urban kind of modern deep beat that like creates that tension, I think. And then of course, Melanie's sweet, soft vocals. She's got a very sweet and soft voice. Um, it's very inviting. Um, and uh, yeah, it carries through in a lot of the songs. As I said, I think the highlight songs for me are definitely Wheels on the Bus, Show and Tell, and then the other one, High School Sweethearts, just because that's a real vulnerable moment on this record. That's a song where, you know, I feel like she's sort of taking herself out of the whole metaphor of, it's still a metaphor, you know, talking about high school romance and how quick lived it can be and how you're trying out dating for the first time and I kind of feel like I'm still at the high school romance stage of my life right now because I've never actually had a real relationship that's lasted and I'm 26 years old. So, I mean, I might still be there, but I can definitely uh, relate to so much of the lyrical content. Um, but it also just has such a satisfying hook and it's very melancholic and sort of mournful. Um, Drama Club is another highlight uh, with a really catchy riff. Um, I think that, you know, Drama Club is dealing with, you know, the roles that women are placed in, gender roles. Um, I don't want to play by your rules. I don't want to play this role that you've given me. Why can't I be president? You know, and so Melanie kind of is trying to, everything is about breaking these constructs. You know, obviously there's a lot of uh, diversity that is shown in the cast. We have a trans woman who is unfortunately being fired because of their sexual presentation, their gender identity. Um, hard to watch, but like important to include. Um, obviously the draconian principal character, you know, we also have in the song, the principal, you know, we have the judges panel of all white men with the old wigs, you know, um, they're the judges on like the bad behavior. And at the end of the day, it often does feel like everything is ultimately judged by some old white men. And it's their opinion that matters above everyone else's. Um, I mean, all of the metaphors are so artfully constructed around the sets, around the characters that are employed, the artifice, the allegory of everything. I mean, it's a modern day cautionary tale, fairy tale, that what Melanie constructs. And it's sort of Disney, sort of Tim Burton. Um, it's a little bit Mean Girls because, you know, it's got the clicks, it's got the plastics, and it's got the whole drama. I'm not going to spend too much time dissecting all of that because... As much as, I mean, I feel like I tend to make these videos pretty lengthy. I do apologize. I just don't feel like there's too much that hasn't already been said that I could add to discuss when talking about this film. I just really wanted to give some of my thoughts on some of the things I really liked. Um, Strawberry Shortcake. That's another sequence that I had to give a shout out to because, um, first of all, the scene with her in the cake and the guy taking slices of it is perfect. Um, and I just think that whole sequence is absolutely brilliant. 
Um, I like, I, I really, I'm just, as I said, so blown away by the cinematography and like the craftsmanship of the sets. Like, I just, I want to go to this school. Like it's, I know you, you're not supposed to want to go there, but oh my goodness. Um, also shout out to the hairstylists because I have not seen more impeccable hairstyling in a music video. I mean, I love the fact that she did sort of distort everything enough to make it feel like it was suspended from reality. Um, there was still so much familiarity that we saw in like some of the characters that were presented to us, but it felt very Dr. Seuss at the same time. And that's the art of children's storytelling. It's like there's those elements of real life, of familiarity that we latch onto to create meaning and to tell a story and to tell, teach a lesson but it takes you out of it at the same time. And so there's such a fantastical element to the story that is head scratchingly, you know, unbelievable. I will say that there are some like weird plot things to me towards the end where I'm like a little bit confused. Uh, why Crybaby, you know, uh, obviously she got this love letter from this guy who really liked her. And then she got strung along by the principal's son, who's like this traditionally very handsome white guy, and uh, falls for his uh, charm as he lies to her and tells her that he actually wrote that love letter. So he takes all the credit. That happens quite some time, quite a lot when, uh, unfortunately, people are trying to compete for each other's attention. But then it appears that she's actually just trying to use him and manipulate him to shut down the entire school and to free all the kids because that's the whole plot is that the kids need to escape. Um, and so at the end, they all eventually do on prom night, uh, but she actually ends up jumping from the house, which is a little strange because it's like, can't you just go down the stairs and go out the door, go out the way you came in? But anyway, um, and <laughs> uh, one reviewer did say, you know, if you're blowing these bubbles, these spit bubbles to fly the school away out into the atmosphere, why can't you fly a spit, blow a spit bubble to safely land as you jump out of the school? Instead, you risk your lives jumping out of the balcony. But anyway, minor details. We suspend disbelief. Um, I'm sure people in the comments will elucidate all of the elements of the plot line for me. Um, and, uh, I, you know, that one part by the end, I was just sort of like, how are they really going to escape? And how, you know, is, are they, I actually didn't think they were going to be able to escape. I kind of felt like all the rest of the kids, like it was a sacrifice. Melanie or Cryberry's character sacrificed letting everyone be free, but she was still stuck in the school. And so it was going to end on a sort of darker note, which is basically like, she's still stuck in the system, even though she's trying to liberate other people. I thought that would have been an interesting sort of plot point. But she escapes as well. They eventually cross over into what looks like heaven. Um, it just made me think like, okay, so the next section is probably going to be college, maybe. Um, that's probably the next time of your life that she would make a movie out of. Um, otherwise, maybe the young workforce, like being in your 20s. I think it'd be really fun for her to carry this narrative through. I mean, she said she has at least two more movies planned. I don't know. She's got a lot of ideas churning for what she wants to do next. There's definitely a to be continued. Um, but I think it would be really interesting to see her tackle being retired in the senior center and using, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm just seeing the storylines already. It's just like all the metaphors are so ripe. Um, and I think it's really cool that, like, this is sort of a niche thing that she's latched onto, which is basically telling these twisted fairy tales by using allegories of our lives as we move through life and chunks of it. And so far, we've gotten child toddlerhood. Now we've gotten primary and secondary schooling. So now we're probably going to go to college, right? That's going to be the next story. Um, and that probably is going to make things even more complicated and complex. You know, the the issues that these students and people are going to be facing are going to be more complex because at that age, that is when you're starting to deal with even more complex stuff. Um, so I can only imagine, you know, how rich the metaphors will become. I think that's where she's heading. I'm really interested to see. There's, you know, a somewhat religious aspect to this film because it does show the afterlife and it looks like you know, like I said, the school is sort of talked about as like a metaphor for the school of life. You know, people talk about in reincarnation, how you go through life like a school and you're going through different lifetimes to learn different lessons. And at that one scene during the nurse's office part, they're like, can we leave now? We've done, we've done enough. We've seen enough. And she's like, 
No, you have not. That's the beauty of life. You're, you have to experience all of these things. You have more to learn. You're not ready to pass through this yet. And so uh, telling that to sort of tell you to keep going during hard times, you know, we are here to just learn. Um, it might not all make sense at the time, but if you look back on it, these are lifetimes that we're accumulating like different knowledge and experiential lessons that we hopefully accumulate to become more fuller ideal, more fuller souls and more fuller selves. That's of course, spiritually speaking. Um, I am very pessimistic right now in my spiritualism, but I still do believe in reincarnation. Um, and my higher selves, I'm still like, I'm there. I'm just not so connected to it as I should be right now. So that's a whole other conversation that I definitely would like to have at some point on this channel. Um, but, uh, I will just leave it at that. All in all, I'm very impressed by this film. Um, it looks like it was actually co-directed by Melanie. So yeah, she had some help, of course. Let's like acknowledge that other people were on board, but it was primarily her doing all the heavy lifting. So it's, you know, it's quite a feat, quite a feat. The choreography as well, very on point choreography um, and uh, costuming. So uh, yeah, I was definitely blown away and I kind of expected to be. I thought, you know, this people have been praising her for a reason. This, this girl is not here to play around. Like she, even though she might look like she is, there is a method to the madness. This girl is here to make really purposeful pop music. Um, and even though some of it sometimes feels like a little generic into my tastes, um, in terms of the production style, um, I, you know, I still have a real ear for some of the bubble, bubblegum sensibilities that she plays with, because some of it is very bubblegum, but it has cross-generational appeal. I always thought it was like, this music's only for like preteen girls. And I was like, well, I am a preteen girl anyway. So that argument's mute anyway, but I was like, no, this is relatable to anyone, um, at least different songs will be, not maybe everything. Um, so let me know in the comments what you thought of K through 12. Um, and if you agree with my comments, like I said, favorite song, show and tell, wheels on the bus and high school sweethearts, especially the opening. Like, I just like that it brings that, like that openness to the song that we don't get in a lot of the other songs, which have such a, you know, rhythm to them. Uh, and then other, you know, uh, shout outs would be probably recess orange juice. I didn't talk about that one. Um, that definitely could be hinting at eating disorders, probably one of the more graphic scenes, um, in the whole film. Um, but one of the most poignant because it is dealing with an issue that is very dangerous. And so you kind of need to shock in a little bit of a way, in a way to, uh, subvert and to question and to, um, get people really talking and thinking about this very heavy topic. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed my take on this amazing art film. Uh, and um, I do plan on reviewing Crybaby, hopefully in the near future. I hope you all have a wonderful, blessed day. Peace, love, and light. Bye.